Okay, welcome back to DIY Cyber Guy. Now, there, there's a lot going on in the news. I know we've covered before, uh, earlier the, the issues in Atlanta with the with a massive cybersecurity heist, we can call it, uh, where the city was really brought to its knees and from a, from a uh, networking perspective, people were having to pay their phone bills uh, manually. Um, many of their automated systems, their court systems, uh, were, were basically nuked back to the uh, you know 60s and 70s in terms of having to do everything manually. And it was really a shot in the uh, a shot in the gut for the city of Atlanta. Um, with me here today is Michael Kaplan. Now, Michael is a Mile 2 cybersecurity instructor. He's a veteran of the U.S. Army's 11th, 11th Special Forces, and he's been a strategic planner for 21 years in the security industry. Welcome, Michael. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. First and foremost, Michael, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. It's an honor to serve, and everybody else who does it as well. Great, and, and thanks for being with us today to uh, talk about your you know, magnificent experiences. So let, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Atlanta. It really was not an isolated incident, incident, was it? Oh no, not at all. It's happening all over the country. Specifically, prior to Atlanta, uh, Savannah got hit uh, very badly. Uh, their administrative side, uh, Fort Stewart, Hinesville, got hit as well. It's it's prevalent. It's everywhere, and we're not immune. Now, a lot of our listeners are people that just have. Families, they've got a home network with you know maybe two or three laptops, uh, a handful of IoT devices like cameras and thermostats, etc. Or maybe they run a small business, they got a little law firm, and they're trying to, you know, uh, manage their networks without having to bring in a high-priced uh, security expert. So l- let's let's talk about how my types of my listeners can uh, do a couple simple steps to avoid getting hit with something that the city of Atlanta uh, got hit with. Um, you know, first of all, do you have to be a city to be a target of ransomware, in your opinion? Absolutely not. Anybody's a target at all levels. Yeah. So even if you're not a, uh, a, a politician with tons of secrets or a movie star with, you know, lots of fame or a billionaire with tons of money, um, you can still be a target. Why, why is that? Why do hackers go after, you know, you and me and small business owners and, and, and other people that aren't rich and famous? Uh, in a lot of cases, it's it's our data. In other cases, it's not us. It's who we might be connected to. We're all nodes in the network, and it might not be us directly. We just happen to be a stumble upon, but we might actually be tied into somebody who might be tied to somebody, tied into somebody who has value. Uh, but everybody has something of value. It doesn't matter what it is. They don't have to be rich. So what what is the stumble upon <laughs> thing? You mean just uh, how to... How does, how does that work? How does a, a hacker get from one person that ha- they happen to be able to victimize to uh, something bigger and something better? What, is that, what does that look like? Oh, if, um, war driving, for example, driving around an apartment complex um, with the software to be able to hack into people's Wi-Fi networks and be able to tie that into GPS and Google Earth so you can actually map all your compromises and then be able to jump from there, daisy chaining it, jumping from there forward um, into your, I mean, your entire connection list. Who knows what I'm going to find if I do that? That's a hack that I guess we don't talk about a lot, at least on this show. So, so, uh, so hackers that are, are, are physically just driving around in a, in, in a car, in a, in a motor vehicle, um, just trying to see what Wi-Fi networks well i should say unsecured wi-fi networks uh they can pick up is that is that what you're talking about absolutely and it doesn't even need to be with special equipment um you can actually go out there <clears throat> with with simple tools like google and if you know some of the vulnerabilities of some of these companies like xfinity comcast whatever yeah you get close enough proximity to a wi-fi it'll let you right in the door as if you were actually part of that network without any special tools now how much Will the act of changing the default password protect you from that? I mean, that sounds like a, you know a walk in the front door kind of a hack. So, how much will just uh, when, you, when you get a Wi-Fi piece of equipment? One of the thing I tell my one thing I tell my listeners to do is, as soon as you turn on that brand new piece of Wi-Fi equipment, change the password. Follow the instructions. Change it to something you know fairly robust. Um, will that act alone? Uh, 
uh, mitigate a lot of the hack that we're talking about right now? In that particular sense, yes. Um, they're also giving an option now, for example, Comcast, you can disable the hotspot feature. So you're actually, when you have a Comcast router in your house, you're actually sharing space and donating space to the neighborhood. Um, I, I encourage everybody to exercise their right to turn that off as well. And hang on, so, so that's by default. So your Comcast router um, comes by default with the, um, with the hotspot, you know, the neighborhood hotspot turned on. Yes. Any other cable providers to your knowledge? Because that's a, I, I didn't know that. Uh, Comcast, I, I'm sure others do. Comcast is, is the monolith in the space, at least here in the Southeast. So that's what mm -hmm. we run across the most. Okay. You know, uh, we, uh, Time Warner Cable Spectrum is uh, pretty big in my neck of the woods in, in the New York area. Uh, I, I, so I will look into that and uh, my listeners just check out the next episode. and We'll get into that in a little more detail because you don't want to be a hotspot. I mean, there's, there's no, you know, selfishly, and you should, should be selfish when you are a user of a network. Uh, you don't want to have anybody and everybody in, in your neighborhood able to access your, um, uh, access your router. Uh, and for two reasons, right, Michael? The uh, one, a good hacker might be able to find a way into your network and look at your computers and get uh, either malware installed or do something on your network that you don't want them to do. And B, it just uses your bandwidth in a way that um, maybe they wouldn't otherwise. Is that about right? Well, they say it doesn't. They say with intentionality they're giving you the bandwidth they promised you, but they're also giving the community convenience. If you're walking through a park and you find a, a hotspot and yeah. it happens to be by an apartment, well, where did that hotspot come from? It came from somebody's device and people appreciate the benefit of having Wi-Fi access while not being on a dedicated network. But that's at your or my expense. Yeah, and, and you know, we all know that the way cable uh, modems tend to work or cable systems tend to work is, the, is, is you're going to share all the bandwidth with the people in your neighborhood anyway. Uh, so if you're all you know, busy downloading video tutorials of something, um, you know, guess what? It, there, it's going to be a bandwidth constraint for everybody in the neighborhood. Uh, but it's, in, in my experience, a router that has more traffic is going to work slower than a router with less traffic. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No doubt about that. No that's doubt. The, uh, that's the Captain Obvious statement of the morning. Um, all right, very good. Let's get back to uh, Atlanta. And uh, I, I understand that there are other hacks. There was other ransomware issues uh, that were not dissimilar to Atlanta. Okay, there's my double negative of the day. Uh, that were similar to Atlanta uh, elsewhere in the state of Georgia. Is that right? Yes. Uh, we had one in Savannah just a few months prior to that. Uh, once again, payroll systems, uh, court systems, uh, make an experience something similar. A local city, Hinesville, which has a big military post in it, experienced something very similar. It's all ransomware, and now it's ransomware as a service, which is why everybody's getting hit with it. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that for a second, because that concept is um, both fascinating and abhorrent to me. The idea that if you're a hacker or you're just, let's just say you're a criminal, and you're a little too lazy to figure out how to do ransomware by yourself, you can actually go to a service now and you know, effectively rent capacity, rent the service of uh, distributing and profiting off of ransomware. Yeah, it used to be back in the day, you had to be pretty capable to right. do an exploit like that. Now they split it. The little script kiddies, the unexperienced, get the front half of that. And they, they, they get the code to take over the computer. What they're not given is the key to unlock it, which they then have to give to the people who created the code who are responsible for collecting the payment and then doing the payment back to the unexperienced person who compromised the computer. That's the way it works. So all you have to have is a low ethical threshold or a non-existent one as the case may be and, and access to the deep web and you can get yourself, uh, you know, basically start your own little ransomware campaign. Absolutely. And that's what's being done. And it's being done on a massive level. If you look at the increases, I mean, we're talking the FBI estimated 4,000 uh, ransomware exploits per day, up, up something like 3,000% in the last four years. Okay, so when you say 4,000 ransomware exploits, you're not talking about 4,000 
individual victims of ransomware per day, you're talking about 4,000 uh, campaigns, if you will, uh, to go after multiple people with each of those individual 4,000. Globally, yes. Mm -hmm. And not, not just U.S., globally. So, you know, to be clear for our listeners, we're not advocating this as a lifestyle to make money. It's uh, no. <laughs> ransomware is not, is not where we want to send people as a career choice. It's illegal uh, it, and it should be. And it's a, it's a crime no matter what country you're, you're trying to do it from. Um, but I, I think the, the obvious point is these attacks are numerous and, and they'll go after anybody and everybody. Um, you know, whether you're, again, whether you're a, a, a movie star, a billionaire, a politician, or just, you know, anybody else, because when, when you have that many attackers, the, the chances of you being attacked, just randomly being attacked just because you're on the internet, uh, goes up quite a bit, doesn't it? Absolutely. And I'd also point out, forget all the rich and famous, if you simply work for a Fortune 500 or a Fortune 1000 company, yeah. and you're allowed to bring your own device and do work on your own device at work, that access to your workspace is enough to make me to want to hack you in your personal space. So you might not have any direct value to me per se, but the fact that you're bringing that device back into a network that's not being managed properly for a company that has something that's worth it, that's yeah. all the more reason to want to go after you. So simple steps to <clears throat> mitigate against ransomware. Uh, I, I usually tell people the first, second, and third steps are back up your laptops. Absolutely. Every day after everything you do, not just once a week, if you had something that was important enough to create, keep a thumb drive, pop it in, save it. I get into the habit, I probably save eight or nine times a day. Yeah. Realistically, if you can save once a week, you're doing all right, unless that's your work computer. If it's your work computer, more, more often than that, definitely. I agree with you. Yeah. And, and you mentioned a thumb drive. So th there's, there's a difference between uh, <coughs> you know, backing up those files that are critical, the, the, the dissertation you've been working on, the, uh, you know, your annual report or what a long-term project. Um, there's a difference between backing up those files and just copying and pasting them onto a hard drive versus a system backup of your entire, something that you could actually restore every byte of your uh, hard drive from. So Absolutely. If you've got an external hard drive and you can mirror your site, yeah. um, then by, by all means, and it's, it's so automated now, it's, it's a box, it's a tether, and it's, it's a click, and it's a mirrored site that you have safely tucked away in a drawer somewhere. Yep. So yes, I, I absolutely. And for our listeners, I, I, I'm planning a whole uh, episode, if not an entire series about uh, about backups and the different types of products. I mean, uh, things like Deja Dupe are, are really very, very solid. Uh, they, they, they utilize network uh, system admin standards in a lot of cases for, for backing up the data. And um, uh, so, so I'm putting together something that uh, that'll itemize those things and, and give people the tools they need to back to do a system backup. So even if their computer turned into an unusable paperweight, you can wipe it out and start from scratch, um, backing up to a point in history before that ransomware got onto your computer. Um, is there just off the top of your head, Michael? Is there any particular uh, backup uh, backup protocol that uh, that you'd recommend for the uh, for the everyday user? No, there. I mean, there's so many great varieties out there. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of vendor neutral on that. I will point out, however, that an exploit will typically exist on a system for 67 days prior to anybody even discovering it. Did so you say what, six or seven or 67? 67, 67, 67. 67, 67 is the average amount of days before it's discovered. And that's in the corporate world. That's not in the private world. So private mm -hmm. extends that out. So I, I would suggest other remuneration steps because you might go to your latest backup, but your latest backup may be compromised. So right. one has to think, one has to think in those terms. Got it. So um, there's obviously a lot going on in the news regarding cybersecurity and, and, and privacy. Um, one of the topics that, uh, uh, that you and I talked about before the interview uh, was military veterans pursuing careers in, in cybersecurity. What's your, what's your viewpoint on that? I think it's I think it's huge. Um, cyber is here to stay. U.S. Army, cyber, uh, Army Cyber Command, 
standing up 10,000 new barracks at Fort Gordon. They're taking it seriously. Actual cyber barracks. Well, I, when I mean that, that, that they're putting 10,000 new barracks in there for their new cyber command. I see. Okay. It's going to be a well-staffed place. Um, as far as careers go, absolutely. Um, the, average, the average job recently based on cyberseek.org, they have a heat map that shows jobs and where they're at and what they pay. Average salary between 94000 and 200000 jobs in every sector, non-tech, tech. You don't have to be the tech guy in the basement to be able to get one of these jobs. Let me just pause you there for a second. What was the uh, website you just said? Cyberseek.org backslash heat map. I think it's backslash heat map. Okay. But um, if you so to- for our listeners, I will, uh, I, I will put that link. I will check out that link, make sure it's the right one. And make sure it's in the show notes uh, because if you're uh, seeking to develop your career in cybersecurity, that's a great place. Sounds like a great place to look. Now, is that for yes. military uh, <laughs> veterans exclusively or, or what? No, no, no. That's for everybody. Um, the NICS website as well is doing a really good job um, taking practical experience and certifications and tying them into real world jobs. Okay. So and- one of the big... I'm sorry. No, just is that nix.com? Which one is that? The yeah, uh, the nisc, the nissc, nicccs. Nicccs.com. Okay, I'll have the link in the show notes also. I, I believe it's a .org, but I'll 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 give you the the address for that. All right, um, but the sure. NICS website is where the NICE, the National Institute of Cybersecurity Education, with the Workforce Development Framework, mm-hmm. they have all that in there, and that ties into categories, work roles paths, sections, and once again, not everything is tech. Um, You might be risk management, you might be audit, you might be, but no, it does a really good job of showing what's out there, what the skills are, and how to tie your skills to those jobs. Fantastic. It's it's such a uh, quickly growing industry that um, uh, I I like the way you described that because the cybersecurity you know, job set is not just people with, you know, advanced degrees or a lot of experience in, um, um, you know, being technology, technical researchers or, you know, actual guys that can work with code. There's, there's lots of other roles and responsibilities uh, related to cybersecurity that, that don't require a tech degree or, you know, five years of tech experience like some of these certifications do. Oh, absolutely. The majority of them are not hard tech. So that should give everybody, that, that should get everybody a, a, a chance to be happy. And yet, as of yesterday, um, I had to put a, a project together. They were open, 287,000 jobs open now, wow. not filled because people don't have the certifications to get the jobs. They're projecting 1.8 million jobs unfilled by 2021. And that's worldwide. No, that's the United States. Worldwide wow. is going to be through. Worldwide is three point five million, and these are David. These are six figure jobs. Sure. This isn't working. This isn't working fast food. This is six figure jobs where the difference between two or three certifications brings somebody from minimum wage to one hundred and twenty to one hundred and forty thousand dollars a year. Right. And I, I mean, it's that it's that simple. And the jobs exist now. They're not projected. They exist. They're vacant. So that's, that's roughly, there are about 8 million people in New York City. So that's about, the, this, the number of cybersecurity jobs equals roughly half of the number of every man, women, and children in New York City. That's, that's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal figure. Um, thanks for sharing that. That's remarkable. Absolutely. And th- th- those numbers are well known. They're in real time. Yep. And they're only predicted to get worse because people have the misconception that they have to come from STEM to be involved in cyber. And the minute they hear cyber, they walk away when, in fact, 32 out of the 37 sectors in cyber are not even, I mean, they're technology, but they're not hard tech. It's tech that everybody can do. So let's say I'm a serviceman or woman, or let's say I'm uh, thinking about a brand new career in cybersecurity. How do you go about starting to get training in in the cybersecurity world without you know, you, you can get an MIT degree, you know, that, that's probably one way you can uh, 
uh, you know, spend eight years in the armed services uh, working on cybersecurity. That's probably another way. Um, but if if I'm trying to turn an interest into uh, a career, where do you start to get that training? First, do the research. Decide what you're good at. An honest self-assessment. What are your skills? If if it, don't try to be a coder. If you're not, identify your strengths. Identify your weaknesses. Then identify paths that lead in cyber and they're out there you can find them and then once you find them you find relevant certifications and you budget for those certifications like what we do at mile two we certify people every single day and they take those certifications and walk out the door Mm -hmm. Um, comptia the basic level up to you know sans or whatever if you want the cadillac and pay 40 grand for a course but there's certifications that will match your interests that will get you to where you want to be. Excellent. And and tell me more about some of those certifications. I mean, where do you? What's a good? What's a good place to uh, start? Um, I'm going to be a champion of Mile2.com. I have to. Uh, and and people can actually see a lot of this on my website. We'll talk about it later. Um, but. I, I list out the certifications. They're, they're solid. They're real world, created by experts. They're used nationally and internationally, and they cost a fraction of what some of these others, like you said, you can go to MIT. Well, you can go to SANS Institute. Yeah. They're great if you have the 20, 30, 40 grand to do it. But if not, there are other quality options out there like Mile 2 that will get it done for you. And for my listeners, just to be clear, uh, Mile 2 is not a sponsor. Um, they did not reach out to me. I reached out to them. Uh, it's because I like what they do. I like the fact that uh, Mile 2 has, has what I would call digestible courses. They, uh, <laughs> not, to, not to bring the, you know, a, a buffet image into the, into, the, uh, into the conversation, but your courses start at something that is approachable, that, that you, can, you can take and see if you like it and see if you want to advance to the next level course and not and on all the way up to you know, full industry-recognized certifications that will allow you to get some of the more senior jobs in the industry. Is that about right? That is. I would also tell you that the, even the lower-level certifications are all mapped to NIST. They're all recognized within the industry. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you have to take a bunch of certifications to get to the ones that matter. Uh, all these certifications are actually mapped to jobs that are in the industry, and you don't need to wait to accumulate 20 to start using them. You can start using them immediately as you get them. Now, what would you say to a, a high school student um, or, or somebody, somebody that doesn't have a career yet, but they're thinking about it, is a mile two course or are there mile two courses that are approachable even for somebody who hasn't even entered the workforce yet? Oh, absolutely. This isn't dependent on, on vocation or profession. It's dependent on passion and, and, and what you intuitively think you can do. So the, the, age, the age piece doesn't, doesn't make a difference. Just like somebody who was 35 or 40 wanted to make a career change. It doesn't matter. There, there are courses in there with tracks and paths for everybody at every age at every time. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, tell me about your book, uh, the, uh, the Prior Service Entrepreneur. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that was a fun book to write. Um, it started out as a program. I wrote a program for the Navy for the reintegration program, entrepreneurship. Turned into a book. I put the book out. I was, I was truly... I was truly favored to have it to have it be received the way it is, and it's been out there since 2013. Uh, just did a new update on 2017, and okay. it's for anybody. It's not. I mean, veterans use it, but anybody who has an interest or has even thought about entrepreneurship, uh, the book is actually written for them, and will give them insights from the real world that their business books will not give them. Fantastic! And where can people find your book? Uh, Amazon.com. Probably the easy, any of the booksellers, Barnes and Noble, what have you. Um, if if you search my name or if you search Prior Service Entrepreneur, it'll pop up. It'll it'll be there on any of the major booksellers. Fantastic. And and where can people find out uh, more about you and your work in general? They go to my personal website, michaelikaplan.com. I made it that easy so I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but that's, that is where everything starts. Uh, if they're interested in mile two, they're links that way. If they're interested in things we're doing with the military, they're links that if they want to get in contact with me, 
connect on LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever it might be. Send me an email, michaelikaplan.com, and that'll drop them where they need to start. And from there, I am not a hard person to find. Fantastic. So all your social media links and everything are right there. If I wanted to follow you on Twitter, I just go to michaelikaplan.com. And you'll see a contact. And when you go into the contact, it's got all the social media. Right. My phone number, my email, everything. I'm a rather, a rather transparent individual these days. Excellent. And where can people find out more about Mile2? Mile2.com. Um, I'm also a partner development rep for them, uh, manager for them. So uh, I, I, I stand up these cyber programs. I launch these authorized training centers that actually train these students. So they can either go to mile2.com and, and reach out for them, or they can come through me. Either way, they're going to end up at the same place. All right. Very good. All right. So, Michael, on the, on the topic of Mile2, um, we talked before the interview, and you had an extraordinary offer to, uh, to make to our listeners. You want to tell me what that is? I'll be happy to. Um, Mile2 is authorized, has authorized me uh, to give away 10 cyber certification courses. Um, we offer 27. So whatever the 10 may be, you'll be able to choose those. So any but, course on the mile two list? Absolutely. Uh, they are industry recognized from the most basic to the most advanced. And I'm going to leave it in your capable hands of, uh, of how the right people get chosen for the right level of training. Wonderful. So for the, for the benefit of my listeners, um, um, Michael mentioned this to me uh, more than a week before this interview, and I, th I thought a lot about it. So here's what we're going to do. I, I want to focus on high school students. I, I, I really like the idea of, of students who are entering the workplace thinking seriously about what cybersecurity is, not because it's easy, not because it's a walk in a park, not because it's the kind of job where you punch a time clock, because it's none of those things. It requires uh, completely out of the box thinking, uh, you're going to be challenged every day in this industry, but it is critical uh, to to everybody that uses the internet in any way, shape, or form. Um, so, if you're a high school student, uh, feel free to write to David at DIY Cyber Guy. And here's what I want you to write: uh, three sentences, a short paragraph to answer this question: Why is cybersecurity critical to the existence of the internet over the next ten or twenty years? Answer that question in a few sentences. Uh, Michael and I will pick the winners, and we will uh, we'll announce them on the show. We'll announce them privately first. So um, send an email to, again, david at DIYCyberGuy.com uh, with your three sentences answering that question. Michael, that's extremely generous. Thank you very much for, uh, for offering that to the students. Oh, my pleasure. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to work for a company that recognized the value of being able to do things like that for people. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be able to make that offer. That's fantastic. So again, Mile 2 is not a sponsor. I believe in, in what you're doing, Michael. I believe in uh, uh, Mile 2 and um, uh, the course selection that they've set up. Um, so it's been wonderful having, a, having you on the show. Thanks for coming by and thanks for making that generous offer. Hey, David, my pleasure. I certainly hope it changes somebody's life and puts them down a path that, that lets them make a difference in other people's lives, right? That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Great. We'll have you on the show again, Michael. Thanks again for your time, and uh, we'll talk again soon. You bet, David. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. That's all the time we have. Thanks for watching, and remember, hit that subscribe button below. You can also go to DIYCyberGuy.com and look down below in the notes for all the links that we talked about in this show. Thanks again for watching. Thank you for listening to DIY Cyber Guy. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this broadcast are for general information only, and we have not knowingly divulged any information that would conflict with any of our non disclosure or confidentiality agreements. Enjoy the internet safely.